and vacation homes, which is a very, um, you know, very popular topic as we'll learn in a second here. So urbanization, I was, when I was looking at the slide, I was like, oh, this is LA. And then I actually looked closer and I saw snow everywhere. And then I saw the big building on my right and I figured out this is Chicago. So, uh, you know, the urbanization as it could, you know, goes to, uh, uh, according to census, is basically the growth in the urban populations, uh, population areas that's, that's been actually outgrowing the uh, nation's averages. So just to give you a glimpse uh, of the most populated areas, this is again, 10 years ago. So, um, you know, these numbers might, might be different, different today, uh, but I'm sure they'll be right around the same, uh, you know, same area. So the highest density populations, believe it or not, uh, population is, is actually in Los Angeles. So 7,000 people per square mile. That's, that's quite a bit. If you compare it to New York, where it's, you know, at the very basically the top five, uh, 53, 5,300. So, and then overall New York, you know, New York, New York area, uh, it is the largest urban area, right, as of 2010, uh, with, you know, over 18 million, uh, million people. So, so more and more people actually moving into, you know, um, into the cities. So according to U.S. Census, you know, not to read this whole thing, but back in 2010, they, they noticed that from, 20, 2000, from 2000 to 2010, uh, the population growth has been, has been consistent and steady. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a, like a big number from 79% to 80.7%. But if you really think about it, the cities represent over 80% of our entire population in the United States, okay? where the actual um, you know, population areas outside of the cities have been declining uh, steadily. So if I would have to put my money on, I would bet that in the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, that trend continues to do so. And even more so, as we all know, that uh, as, um, as the millennials you know, grow in and grow older and actually become more you know, financially independent, they actually like to move into the cities, at least right now, and you know, millennium population is over 93 million people. So that's, that's something to kind of look, look forward into and really see how the numbers will work out. Now, uh, going back to the actual numbers, uh, more and so of, of the purchases of the homes. So National Association of Realtors back in 2005, uh, they posted a, a survey that they did a year prior of 2014. And it's basically what it's called, it's investment in a vacation home buyer survey. And what they saw is that increased amounts of uh, secondary homes have been bought from 2013 to 2014. So 2014 was the absolute booming year. Uh, again, this is a five-year-old numbers, but in 2014, they, they sold 1.13 million units, okay? That's up 57% or actually almost 58% from 717,000 back in 2013. So significant increase, okay? Uh, vacation homes uh, accounted for 21% of all transactions in 2014. So that's, that's almost a quarter of all home buying that was made in 2014 in the United States. That's a substantial number. Uh, out of those 21% of actual vacation homes that, was purchased, that, that were purchased, 54% of them were single home dwellings, okay? 27 were condos, and then 18% were town uh, townhouse uh, or, or row house. So, all, all represent, you know, a, a pretty statistical increase from 2013. So most of those homes, as we have sure, you know, all understand, would, were bought in the beach area, which makes total sense. 19 of them were in the country and 17 were mountain lodges. So this is a kind of nice, you know, little statistic to kind of know what, what's going on, or at least used to going on back in 2015. So, uh, you know, when we're talking about the smaller kitchens, okay, in, in transition from this home buying, you know, in a secondary home, a lot of these dwellings, especially, you know, the ones that are, like, let's say, on the very densely populated beach area, I mean, you look at any coastal, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, those coastal lines are really typically, you know, set in stone, zone, zoned out, so building something there is virtually hard, depending where you're trying to build. Or if you do build something new, you're limited to the space where you can build unless you go up, you know, up vertically, which sometimes people don't want to do. So with that said, a lot of these kitchens, you know, really kind of shrinking in size. And what we're seeing recently, you know, more and more lately, and we're, we're going to get into this in a, minute, in a minute here, is that the kitchen actually disappears as a room and becomes kind of a blend of the overall open space. And there's no necessarily kitchen per se. Sometimes, as we'll see, in, you know, in the future here, 
that it just becomes kind of like a part of overall, um, you know, greater room, what, what we call it. So, um, and, you know, and the buyers actually like that. They like the openings of the space, especially for the secondary home, especially when they're hosting a lot of events and, you know, friends and family and whatnot. So they like to have this open space. But not, you know, uh, the very important thing is that there's still, because we're talking about a luxury home and luxury home buying and a remodeling, uh, they still like to see all the high-end feature that they have in a main house, we represent in a smaller scale, let's say, vacation home. So European trends toward, you know, towards smaller kitchens. Um, so this is something that we've been observing for the longest time. So as the article points out of U uh, UK uh, Daily Mail, um, they, they pointed out that what they're seeing is that the overall size of the kitchens has been shrunk to basically a third of what it used to be since 1960s. And that attributed again, Overall, you know, just people go out more, maybe take out food more and don't cook as much as they used to. Uh, but also moving into the urban areas, the overall, you know, small dwelling size could be, could be a culprit. So that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, what we're learning here. So uh, as Peter Rawlings pointed out, who is the chief executive of Marsh and Persons Real Estate uh, back again in London, he says, we're starting to see the kitchen completely disappear as a room of its own right. It is being uh, subsumed into a wider living space or a dining space. So again, United States here, we're actually seeing a trend away from the dining room spaces, but what, what Peter actually says here is that it incorporates the overall living space as we saw in the slide before. This is actually one of my favorite pictures that really describes what I mean by kitchen kind of like blends into overall living quarters. So I understand that what, when you guys looking at this picture, you're probably seeing, well, wow, this is a huge house. But what if this house is really, all it is and maybe there's a bedroom somewhere underneath or upstairs and that's about it so what you see right here and the reason why i like this is because this is a complete separation of multiple different zones outside of the kitchen on your left you have a a, a child uh going into refrigeration drawer to maybe grab a juice or a snack right above it you see a coffee system behind uh um you know the woman in the house uh you can see the actual uh wine storage unit probably with a wet bar and on the right side you can see a tiny little uh glimpse of maybe main kitchen or where the cooking pretend you know will be happening um even though you know uh, this is a great opportunity to really kind of spread out it necessarily you know busy zones away from the main cooking preparation station this picture really highlights how the kitchens now become the real, uh, you know, blend of the overall space rather than just have a, a separate standalone kitchen on the side of the house or on the side of the room. So, um, so who's buying the houses? Okay, and uh, obviously the the population that still makes the, the the high end ticketed purchases are predominantly baby boomers. Okay, and uh, a lot of times people think that baby boomers downsize, but that's really not the case here. What we're showing is that a lot of baby boomers are actually still in the workforce. Okay, so they're not retiring or not planning to retire. Um, and when we're talking about the high end and obviously high end purchases of secondary homes, typically the money is not an object. So the reason for not retiring is not the, you know, 401k and making more money before they, you know, walk off to the sunset. It's really more about the sheer fact that they enjoy what they're doing and they love working and they don't want to retire. So but when, when we talk about this, a lot of times these, uh, these people can purchase secondary homes in the city. So they can buy a loft or a pair de tear. They can buy a secondary home or vacation home somewhere in the beach. And uh, they would, what they do, they actually keep the main house for the children that might be, you know, spread out of the country, working in different states and different coasts. And when everybody comes together on during the holidays, they still love to take uh, that opportunity to bring everybody in under the same roof, especially if it's the roof where everybody grew up. So realistically, we're not talking about selling main house. We're talking about buying more properties as we go. So not a bad thing to do. Obviously not everybody's doing this, but kind of we're, we're seeing that trend as well. So, you know, and as I mentioned, you know, buying a secondary home, especially if it's close to work is becoming a trend as well. So with that said, we're gonna actually jump into the learning objective number two, and we're gonna talk about what the design looks like for a small space. So, you know, what to include in the popular features and what, you know, customers like to see. So, and I, I'm gonna talk about this later on as well, but small kitchen space does not mean a budget kitchen. So we're not talking about here a very something convenient and easily done. We're talking about 
uh, high-end features of a main kitchen that uh, your customers accustomed to see uh, throughout the years that's been replicated on a smaller scale uh, of their secondary you know home that might be a little bit smaller depending on where, where it is or what it is um, but they're not willing to sacrifice anything and believe it or not sometimes as I mentioned before it is harder to replicate and make things more convenient and comfortable on the smaller scale rather than the big scale so Items that are very popular and people obviously are still asking. So LED lighting is a default. I think the 88% really does not represent it. At, at, at this point, it's 100%. If you don't do LED lighting, it's the question is like, why? So computer area, your charging station, 50% as well, probably higher now. I mean, we are slaves to our devices, uh, especially now during 2020 and, and the pandemic of this time. Everybody's working from home. I'm working from home. Uh, this is the thing that was gonna happen more and more. Typically, I sit behind my dining room table, but you know, I had to. I lost that battle today, so I was pushed in the upstairs room. But point being is that we're we're spending more and more time at home, and probably will do so for the foreseeable future. Um, larger pantry spaces. So what, what what customers actually like to see maybe necessarily not so much cabinetry, but have allocated space where they can store all of their non-perishables. Uh, and then cooking, uh, you know, small cooking appliances, maybe, uh, you know, pots and pans, whatnot. So pantry overall size is increasing. Undercover appliances, when we're talking about small kitchens in a high-end luxury, uh, you know, market, under counter becomes the key as we'll learn moving forward. Because sometimes you just want to eliminate all the uppers altogether for, uh, you know, overall view and actually light of feel, making sure that, you know, the, the space is not feeling clustered. So this is something that, you know, becomes very, very important. And you can really design your entire kitchen with all of your appliances all being under counter without looking into anything at all whatsoever. Operating the appliances, 30, 35% looks for, looking for that. The reason behind it, because they want to have the same look and touch and feel what they have in the main house to be replicated in a smaller scale in their secondary home. Imagine somebody is driving a brand XYZ, they're not gonna switch to a smaller car or a different car just because you know the roads are smaller. So, so point being, is appliances is the same key. They wanna have the same functionality, same, uh, same usability and the ease of use, what they, like I said, accustomed to in the bigger homes. Um, adaptability, universal design, we talked about this in aging of place. Uh, it's important for some people because you know the secondary home purchase might be a long time investment and they're not gonna be doing uh, anything afterwards, so why not? And drinking water filtration systems, believe it or not, we're getting more and more greener and we understand that drinking a water that's filtered through the, through the tap is actually much better than buying bottles of water. So that's becoming a thing as well. Don't look at this picture. This is clearly not a very small house, okay? So, but um, this is just kind of showcases, you know, again, as I mentioned before, that no matter, you know, how small or big the house is, when you're looking for a high-end features, you want to make sure that they, you know, they're present everywhere and the small house is no expect, exception. So this is a kind of nice little poll that showcases, you know, what the buyers are looking for if they're spending a $500,000 or more. So 54% of luxury buyers identifies a chef's kitchen at the top feature of their house hunting. Reasons behind it. Kitchen is typically the most expensive room to remodel in the household. Okay. Outside of maybe ensuite bathroom, which is a new lingo that we're learning now. Uh, that can become very, very popular and very, uh, you, know, um, you know, hard to accomplish because the, the work is so tedious. Kitchen is the number one, uh, you know, expenditures when it comes to remodeling the home, typically. 46% of the buyers expecting to pay $500 or more uh, would like to have a, some sort of wine cooler somewhere within the household. So that's becoming, like I said, uh, you know, a very uh, uh, popular, you know, request. And then 42% that are, you know, buying a home for $500,000 or more, uh, would like to see a warming drawer, especially if you have a larger, you know, families to uh, to accommodate and staggered meals. So, um, Susan, Sarah, I, I don't know if we actually talked about, um, you mentioned her name in the previous conversation. I, I think we did. Uh, she is a uh, designer out of Florida, as far as I believe, uh, or actually New York. I'm so sorry. And from New York. And, uh, you know, and she talks about overall what the what the true small kitchen attributes and designing um, you know techniques you should be using so we're going to go through them right away first and foremost larger doors and drawers the reason behind it is because when you start designing a lot of small drawers the small space can become cluttered so what she's saying is that you know get the big doors it reduces the visual clutter 
uh, and makes, you know, makes uh, uh, it, it reduces the busy design in general. Consistent colors. Uh, because your space is very small, make sure your colors are very light, okay? Don't, don't paint the kitchen in black. Uh, and if you do uh, you know, uh, introduce a different color, no more than two, because if you introduce more than two colors, now it becomes very you know, uh, busy and cluttered as well. Um, so, so, so this is a good, you know, um, some good, good thing to, to kind of, uh, you know, follow, uh, right size of appliances. So again, clients might not understand that when they're moving to smaller space, 60 inch range might not be the perfect ideal option for their, so, so educating them and really showcasing them and telling them, listen, maybe 24 inch oven will be just, just enough or 24 inch column will be just enough refrigeration. This is going to be just fine. Again, depending how much use you will need out of the space we can determine you know, how to do it. But this is a perfect application where the only cabinet you can see here is a tall refrigerator on your left, which actually we don't know if it is or not. Maybe it's just a small pantry and maybe the refrigeration is hiding in the drawers underneath under counter. So, uh, oh, I guess, yeah, here we go. So be realistic about client's lifestyle when specifying appliances. Avoid buying appliances which are larger than what's necessarily needed. So, Questions to ask about clients when you're designing a space. Okay, so this is kind of very similar to something what we do in our facilities when we bring the clients through and we ask them and we try to select, you know, the proper appliance sizes for them uh, because they might want A, but they don't realize they really don't need it. And the B option might be much, much better to their lifestyle than what they're essentially was thinking, they were thinking. Uh, but the questions are as such, you know, will there be one cook or more cook at the same time? Do you anticipate cooking just for those who live in the house or you know, you'll have a larger meals for the people that will come in consistently, your friends and family? Uh, you know, how, many, how many guests or how often you will, you will, you get, you will have guests uh, in your household? Will you cook, uh, you know, cooking be limited to warming up packaged meals or will you be cooking from the scratch? Um, in terms of refrigeration, do you foresee shopping daily or, you know, or every, every other day, or would you buy groceries for the whole week and then just utilize it and go to the store once? Um, and ventilation. So ventilation is actually the key in small spaces. It is much more important in the smaller dwellings than the larger homes because there's not that much space. So if you're going to start burning something, that, that smell, that odor will, will transition everywhere much, much quicker. So, so ventilation is a key as well. So um, the other thing that Susan suggests is that if you, you know, if your clients to foresee using small appliances, create a designated spots for them, somewhere to put them away, store them away. So you reduce the visual clutter of the overall small kitchen space. So that's kind of like a, what, what, what the design, kitchen designers used to call like a, a small appliance garages. So it's a nice thing to, you know, to design uh, anytime you're looking into a smaller space overall. So Lighting. So lighting is very important, obviously, in a small space. Lighter cabinets, lighter floors, key to help that. But when we're talking about lighting, we have to specify three key elements. Okay. So we have to have talk about actually, obviously, general lighting when you know when natural lighting is no longer available. Uh, task lighting for prep uh, areas and uh, overall accent lighting throughout the space to make everything seem lighter. So we're even talk, going to talk about the lights inside the cabinet, you know, through the uh, 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 glass and whatnot, because it elevates overall and makes things seem more spacious. Natural lighting is the key. Okay, uh, natural lighting just helps to brighten everything up, makes everything seem larger. And even if a space is very small, which in this particular case it actually is, um, a full glass door, which you see right where actual glass wall, becomes so great because your spacing now becomes visually much much larger. So, you know, um, skylights is a great idea to introduce, you know, natural light if it's possible. Obviously, if we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, high rises and whatnot, you know, natural lighting is typically usually utilized very well because th those, you know, glass buildings they actually have large, large window openings and the full walls made out of, you know, glass. But uh, if the situation were, where you're not, you, you definitely want to make sure you're bringing in your kitchens to close to the light, natural lighting as close as possible. In the cases where there is, you know, no way to get get to natural lighting, ambient lighting that produces the actual natural light look uh, is also something that you know should be considered. Uh, Banquet or built-in built seating. So this is great in the situations where you want to eliminate the chairs and overall reduce the you know the chair clutter. So 
So very popular if you're putting maybe like a breakfast nook or breakfast table right next to it. So even though it becomes a storage pantry, like you can see, you can see in this particular case, but also is a great opportunity for implement the seating and then, you know, uh, minimize, uh, uh, you know, like I said, chairs in this particular, you know, if the kitchen is too small. Open shelving. What, what's good about open shelving is that um, it breaks out the heaviness of the actual big doors. Uh, what Susan suggests, she actually says that instead of like cluttering the shelves with small items, bring the dishes and larger items because, well, A, you can utilize it nice and easy because you can take everything off the shelving and overall it decreases the clutter look. So uh, open shelving is the key, especially when, you know, when the spacing is limited to, to overall give the uh, lighter look. Glass front cabin cabinets, as I mentioned before, with the light. So what that does, uh, the glass front actually brings your eye looking to the, inside the cabinet. So overall increases the depth of your kitchen, even visually. So, and uh, the lining under, you know, inside the cabinet glass is actually uh, very nice too, because it in, in enhances overall the you know, visual effect of the kitchen, um, as I just mentioned right there. So, Glass front refrigerator, same idea as the glass front lighting, uh, grass floor doors and the lighting inside the doors. This is a great idea for a refrigerator because again, you're, you're looking inside the machine and especially if you turn on the lights, it gives them more depth. So, um, so this is a great idea to visually enhance the size of the room. This is another point where sacrificing upper cabinets in the lieu of design and actually making the space feel more open is becoming the key. So in this particular kitchen, what you see right here, the only tall cabinet you see is where refrigerator is, and then everything is kind of brought, brought, brought down. The, the cabinets that you see on your left and white, so are you know, wood glass uh, fronts, so increases the overall feel. And then, you know, everything else can be positioned in, the, um, in your island or an under counter application. So again, depending what your you know, client's needs are, if they do need a lot of storage, then obviously we'll have to look at something different. But if the storage is not an issue and it's a secondary home, they're not particip you know, anticipating storing all of their pots and pans that they collect in the last you know, 20, 30 years, then this is a great opportunity to really eliminate all the uppers, main producers, couple of uh, Run the uh, backsplash all the way to the all to the way to the to the ceiling and uh, um, I can't hear you very well. So uh, that so natural light, you know. Oh, excuse me. Could you repeat what you said. Loud? Um, I couldn't hear you very well. Yeah, Andre, um, you cut out for a little bit. If you could just repeat what you had said on that last slide. I think, uh, oh, I think you're, there you go. I'm breaking up. Am I breaking up? Yeah, yes, you did break Is up. Is this a slide? Bit. Yes, that's it. Oh, uh, thank you. Yep, thanks. All right, so uh, so what we're talking about here is um, depending on your client's needs, uh, you know, if you can eliminate the upper cabinets altogether and uh, basically sacrifices for the visual, uh, that helps to increase the overall spice, uh, space and dimension of the room, especially, like I said, if the storage is not needed per, per se and you can... Um, you're cutting so out again. Um, I wonder if, can you, can you guys hear me? Um, I can hear you now, but you were cutting out again. Trying to do the best we can. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wonder if the internet is uh, breaking up in and out, but look, I, I, pretty good, but let me know if you guys, Guys don't hear me okay and I'll, I'll get I'll get back so um, natural light we talked about that the more the better so you know utilize it as much as you can uh, and it's, it's you know anytime you have an opportunity to introduce windows uh, and, and glass doors into the kitchen definitely you do so um, obviously this is this is another picture but you know maybe natural light is not as easy to do on the high-rise building especially if the kitchen is pushed back in somehow so 
this is where you know you you definitely you know introduce the ambient lighting into the into the mix. Uh, but if you are designing a home, um, like maybe uh, you know like a like a beach cabin or whatnot, definitely try to utilize as much light as possible. So diverting traffic flow. Um, everybody can hear me well, Chris. Um, you're you're going in and out. Um, no, I'm not. Chris, Chris, is that, yeah, is, you're, is that you're, the same on your, your end or is it? Is, you're is fine it, now. Okay. Well, like I said, apologies. It's probably it's internet provider, something's happening. So anyway, so we're going to, we're going to jump in here. Uh, diverting traffic flow. So anywhere you have a situation where, where you can take smaller appliances and position them elsewhere. to let's say, uh, eliminate, you know, the, uh, the busy schedule of the, cook or the chef actually in the kitchen, uh, do so because it will help, you know, somebody like you see in the picture on the left, uh, maybe you create a, a kid zone where they can come in and grab a juice or an ice cream, whatnot, versus going into the kitchen, into the main refrigeration option, if that's the key. So anytime you have an opportunity to move something out of the kitchen, that's not essential. It will help to overall spread the, you know, uh, environment in much better case and help, you know, uh, divert your traffic overall throughout the house and not necessarily into the kitchen. So under account appliances, there's so many different, you know, aspects, you can, how you can do it in which appliances you can use and where, but, you know, it consists of under counter beverage centers and wine units, you know, microwave somewhere else, or even full on ovens, uh, outdoor refrigerators and, and drawers. So if overall the under counter appliance is becoming more and more popular as more and more people learn about them and getting accustomed to it, especially using, and, and when, again, if you're sacrificing the uppers for the overall design attributes to make the space to seem more spacious, this becomes a key. So something to consider, especially when you're designing a small space. So we're gonna jump into discussion number, uh, uh, topic number three, and we're gonna talk about actual refrigeration options that are available. So small space, high quality, as I mentioned before, when we're talking about small luxury kitchen, we, doesn't, we do not talk about budget space. So all the features, all the benefits, all the high-end textures and, and everything that your clients would expect to see in their main house, they would like to see in their secondary beach condo or ski condo or a loft, whatever that is. So no sacrifices here. Again, the control and everything that they used to from their main home is also the key here. So if they have an appliance brand of their choice, in their household, bring it into their secondary location because that way when they're transitioning into their secondary place, it's a smooth, easy transition. They're, ha they're happy and everything works and feels great because just, just like it would be in, you know, in main home. So um, overall, the other thing that's very important to them is that when you put in these high-end appliances and high-end features and textiles and, uh, and marbles and whatnot, into the a secondary home, it evokes the feeling of a main kitchen, like, you know, and brings them back to their main space. So no, 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 uh, no budget cutters here, so to speak. So under counter refrigeration, uh, that's 24 inches. The number one thing that's good about this, when you are doing a large plank doors and the 24 inch is the same size as your door next to it, you can put a door cover on it and you don't even know it's a refrigerator. So everything seems nice and seamless. These machines available as a refrigerator, freezer, or combination units, so you can put all the necessities right in a small machine. So you don't, if you don't need a larger refrigeration per se, like you see on the left side, the toll units, the 24 inch under counter refrigerator can be a key uh, to a smaller kitchen, you know, where only two people will be living or, you know, or, or three, whatnot, and it's not gonna be used for large, larger scale events. Uh, 24 inch calm refrigeration, so also a key here. So if you only have a space for a tall refrigerator and it's only one space, you can have a 24 inch column refrigeration that can be either or, okay, refrigerator or freezer, depending on your needs, or a combination of both, we can only have one refrigerator option. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to, to really like talk about uh, different key uh, elements when you're designing a kitchen and the refrigeration is typically the hardest one because in the cooking aspect, you have multiple, you know, you have multiple cooking appliances you can incorporate, cooktops, you know, range tops, if you don't want to have a full on range with a wall oven somewhere spread out the kitchen, refrigeration becomes typically a much harder topic because, you know, what we need here is 
uh, typically the space inside so we can store a lot of food if we choose to. But also, you know, m most refrigeration is not, uh, is, is not, you know, it's not very shallow. So, so what we're looking here is positioning of something that can be very narrow uh, to accommodate in the space, but also be large enough to, to you know, hold a lot of foods, uh, produce, you know, vegetables, whatnot for your customer needs. So refrigeration drawers is a great other op uh, you know, uh, option to have, especially near the working stations or prep stations. So if you, let's say, if you don't decide to do a large refrigerator in a small kitchen space, you can separate the refrigeration and put multiple drawers throughout the space and position them strategically where it needs to be. So in this particular case, you know, this is a warming, you know, uh, sorry, warming drawer. This is a refrigeration drawer right next to the uh, salad pre prep station in the sink. So, you know, it's a great, great opportunity to really kind of like separate the refrigeration throughout the space. Here's another one. So this is where, you know, you're really just basically eliminating all the upper, you know, refrigeration altogether in lieu uh, in favor of the under counter refrigeration options. Um, I've seen personally many times where the kitchen has three refrigeration drawer options in all things all together or separate throughout the space, however you want to design it. But that way you don't have to, you know, really design any tool, you know, cabinets, whatnot, and you can move all of your appliances in the under counter application. So one thing to really, really, you know, kind of talk to your clients about and let them know that this can be an option. You don't have to buy a big tool refrigerator if you don't want it. Okay. 24 inch freezer. So this can be great opportunity, especially, you know, maybe near the outside door, if you're doing like, you know, out, outdoor kitchen as well, where kids can jump in grab, you know, grab an ice cream, whatnot. You can store, you know, uh, frozen berries and, and, you know, snacks, whatnot, or a refrigeration option as well. So it's a great opportunity when you're separating the two, positioning them where it will be used the most. 18 inch freezer. So the reason why we're even talking about this because a lot of times the clients don't even know that these sizes exist. So when you are designing a space, you can let them know that, listen, we do have an option of 18 inch freezer that we can have it, um, you know, for, for needs if you, if you choose to. So um, if somebody likes to stock up, let's say for your mountain lodge and you're bringing the food and you store it for many, many months uh, and let's say like, you know, leaving the space is, is a problematic, going into the taller section obviously will give you more you know, usable space. So 18 is, is possible, we have it, or other you know, manufacturers make it. And what, what's good about this, you can position these whatever you want it. So you can put a freezer on one side of the kitchen and move refrigeration or maybe drawers on the other side. So near refrigerator freezer options, uh, you know, 30, 36 inch is, is pretty common in the small kitchen spaces. So depending on the size and needs of the family, this is something that we can absolutely, you know, uh, incorporate in the, in the kitchen and, and just do one-stop shop where you don't have to bring in and utilize other, you know, under-counter space to maybe utilize more under-counter refrigeration, whatnot. So for one refrigerator, all your clients want the, what they need, 30 or 36 is an option that's available. And then if you want a 36, some of them actually have a glass door through. So this is again, going back to kind of see through and, and, and making sure that the space visually becomes larger. This is a great opportunity to utilize this aspect, especially if you have upper cabinet doors with glass in them. So uh, 20, 18 and 24 inch wine units. Now going back to the luxury. So we're talking about a, a you know, luxury kitchen space that is on a smaller scale. Doesn't mean that the clients that own this particular home or you know, apartments uh, you know, will stop liking their wine. So when you do design a space and if you do learn that your clients do love wine and they have an extensive collection, you can tell them, listen, this is perfect. You can replicate it from your main home into your secondary home with the same attributes and same features. And we can utilize it in a smaller scale with 18 and 24 inch all tall wine units, you know, that will protect your collections all through, you know, uh, from humidity and um, your lights and, you know, vibrations and the heat overall. So, so the same that can be done in their main home can be done on a smaller scale here, especially if this is a home that gets unattended for extended period of time. This is a unit that you definitely absolutely should, you know, uh, uh, mention to them if they do like wine, because again, they can, if it's a summer house, they can use it three months, you know, a year, and then it's going to be sitting there 
for you know for months and months on a tent well the republic will something will be there but it's a great opportunity for them to store their wine and know that nothing's going to happen to it even if they're not going to see it you know for six seven months so ice machines so the ice machine is a great opportunity to talk you know it uh, applies to incorporate obviously outdoor but also indoor one thing that's very you know common if it's a uh, a beach, let's say a secondary vacation home near the beach or a ski house or somewhere in the country, these homes typically have a lot more people coming in to, you know, spend the weekend together. So larger parties are the key here. And what happens in larger parties, it's great to have a, you know, a separate ice machine that can produce up to 50 pounds of ice per day where nobody has to run to a main refrigerator to grab ice consistently. And then at a certain point, the ice will run out and the machine has to keep up making it. So this is a great opportunity to really incorporate something of a machine that will be used consistently, um, you know, throughout the time when, you know, your high-end clients will be staying in that particular household. So uh, these machines are typically 15 inches. So what's good about this, they can be easily hidden uh, within the cabinetry. They don't need a lot of space. You can put a custom panel on it. So that's going to be great because uh, you can hide it completely. With that said, we're going to go into learning objective number five. We're going to, uh, so, excuse me, four. We're going to talk about the cooking options, which are plentiful. So um, again, going to the small kitchen space doesn't mean that the appliances have to be budget or you know, or not performing to the highest degree. So a luxury kitchen will always ask for a high-end performance and high-end appliance. So we're going to talk about the gas, you know, first, uh, you know. We, we have gas options, there's, there's electric options, there's induction options we're gonna talk about as well. But still gas, we're in New England and I'm sure uh, it's not gonna be a surprise for anybody, gas is still something that customers always like to have. Granted, not every household will be able to support gas depending where they are, uh, but the good news is there are all, all kinds of options um, to meet your client's needs depending where, what, you know, what they're building and where they are. 30 inch gas cooktops. A lot of people don't even think that, you know, high end brands actually carry them, but, but they do, you know, we do. So, you know, gas been around for many, many years. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about gas, people, especially gas ranges, people think about big appliances, 36, 48, 60 inches. So when we tell them that we actually have something smaller, like 30 or even smaller, something like this, like 15, they're like, wait, what? I didn't even know this existed. The good idea here is that, you know, a lot of the many manufacturers behind appliances have options of small scale, especially 15 inch modules. We can actually create your own cooking appliance of any kind of need. So if the gas is not the only thing you want, you can include it maybe, you know, a grill, maybe induction, maybe something else, maybe like a deep fryer or a steamer. So there's a lot of options that they can utilize. And the good news again, with the small appliances, not talking about ventilation, but you can separate them throughout the space. Make it, maybe you can put a steamer next to the, you know, a sink and then put a gas, uh, you know, appliances induction on the, on the island. So you can separate and actually use the small scale appliances to divert the traffic flow, especially if there's gonna be more than one cook in the kitchen. So something to really think about and something to, you know, uh, offer them as an option um, if, if, you know, if a single appliance just doesn't work in the particular space you're trying to design. So, and as I mentioned before, this can be utilized, you know, either a at the larger scale, maybe with a next appliance that's that's uh, you know a bigger appliance next to it, or a la carte, meaning you can position them anywhere and you can combine all kinds of uh, you know uh, features like this throughout the uh, throughout your kitchen. Um, Thirty inch range and range tops. Again, if somebody wants that you know true professional look, they still want to have it. We do have these, and you know, it's it's a, it's the key here as well because um, that way they don't have to move from appliance to appliance. If they have a 16 inch at home in a big home, like hey, 60 doesn't work here, but the 30 will, and we have it. So this is great. And these come, you know, in any particular case, you can have a dual fuel. You can do all gas depending on electrical, you know, specifications. I know in a high rise, you know, in places like New York and Boston. Um, you know, sometimes electrical is an issue. So we see a lot of gas product going directly into the high rise because, you know, you can get only 120 amps for the entire apartment. Uh, let's say if it's a peer to tier where the client does want to have a gas product. So we sacrifice, you know, the electrical, you know, attribute of the range for the gas. And here's a picture of the 30 inch range top. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, 15 inch, 30 inch modules, electric cooking modules. So, 
um, where the electrical is an issue and the gas is not available, electric is a great option. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not electrical, but induction, it becomes an issue because of your uh, electrical supply. Gas just cannot be done in the particular kitchen. We do go to electric. This is a merely, this, the only reason why we still even have this as an option because induction is superior in whichever way you look at it. There's no benefit of electric versus induction. The only reason why we would ever specify electric cooking versus induction if your electric supply is limited to depending where you're building. Um, this is a, uh, just a picture of a 30 inch. So talking about induction. So Kermit uh, Baker, AA chief economist says, induction cooking appliances, which are more energy efficient and generally left to be safer for occupants also read high on our net popularity scale in the, uh, in the first time it's been covered by this survey. So I'm not actually sure what kind of survey they're, you know, they're, they're talking about, but as I mentioned before, induction is a very easy way to cook because there's no heating element involved in here. So honestly, if you're doing, designing something uh, that wants to be safe, let's say if you're in a wooded area, a ski lodge, um, and even beach condo and the cleanup is just like, not something that nobody wants to deal with. Induction is really the key. The other really good thing about the designing induction into the cooking surface is that it can be flat, can, you know, with your countertop and you can use induction as a uh, prep station if it's not engaged. And then the other good thing is that induction will never turn on unless you have cooking um, uh, you know, vessels on it. Meaning, so if you don't put your pots and pans on the surface, it will never ignite. And so it will never get hot. You will never accidentally turn it on and burn yourself or burn whatever's on it. So it's a very, very safe appliance. When you take off your, you know, cooking vessels, it will, it disengages, meaning it turns, shuts off by itself. It never gets hot except the residual heat from the glass, you know, on the glass from your cooking surface. So nothing will ever boil into it. Hence the cleaning of the surface will be super easy. And again, if it's a vacation home, I'm sure cleaning of a full on range becomes an issue. Somebody probably doesn't want to deal with it. So I say induction is very, very nice and really something to, you know, to, to offer to your clients uh, when they're designing a secondary home, especially again, because nobody wants to do extra work, you know, on vacation. So um, as I said, induction is a very popular option. If the electrical supply is not an issue, this is the way to go versus electric. And these can come in 15, 24, 30, or 36 inch uh, you know, applications. And the good news about this, again, for, safe, for safety purposes and safe space, um, you know, saving the space, these modules are about two and a half inches thick. So all the space underneath the induction cooking will be storage, which is fantastic because in a smaller scale, smaller kitchens, storage is important. Accessory units, as I mentioned before, 15 inch modules have so many different options. You can uh, you know, uh, really do, uh, you know, multi-unit cooking, like a wok burning right here. You can do induction griddle, which you see right next to it. You can do electric griddle. Uh, you know, we have steamers, we have uh, deep fryers. There's so many options to choose from. So when, when option of cooking, especially on vacation home, you don't want to put on one single big appliance. This can be an answering, you know, golden ticket to really solve all your issues because you can position them throughout the space. Okay. The, obviously the, the pieces like the grill and anything they'll produce a lot of smoke, definitely put it on ventilation up above it. And when I'm talking about ventilation, really, you know, the two key, you know, features here, the downdraft actually, believe it or not, is the number one popular option for ventilation in vacation homes because it hides inside the cabinetry and it's, you don't see it, especially if you're eliminating all the upper, you know, uh, upper cabinets and you're utilizing only the bottom, the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, portion. So if you do decide to have an actual true ventilation with a true, you know, vented, vented hoods, um, putting it, you know, against the wall, especially maybe with open shelving or no shelving of any kinds uh, is a great way to really kind of like eliminate the clutter and like, you know, make the overall uh, spacing much larger. Uh, micro drawers, uh, great opportunity to, you know, to, to put it underneath the counter, as I mentioned before, out of sight and out of mind. Um, you know, high-end features such as, you know, moisture and, you know, temperature sensors are, you know, pretty, pretty much something that's very popular uh, in, you know, high-end application. Another great thing about these is that these can work as a warming drawer application, not a true warming drawer, but it have warming drawer feature. So when the space is an issue, a microwave drawer basically functions as two appliances in one. 
as a warming drawer and a food preparation appliance. So something to, you know, obviously to talk about when, it's, you know, when you're representing to your clients. I love this picture because it really represents what the small kitchen living is all about. The only tall cabinet you see right there is right in the middle on, or on the right of the slide where there's three appliances next together with a, uh, uh, you know, storage below and above it. And that's it. Everything else is moved into the under counter. So I'm sure there's a refrigeration option somewhere on, you know, underneath there. As you see, this kitchen actually has a, uh, you know, multi cooking surfaces. So this kitchen utilizes three different modules uh, with a larger hood up above. Now, you know, what, what's good about this is that when you're talking about separating small appliances and positioning them throughout the kitchen, in a 24 inch application, there's so many different options. You have, a, you know, convection steam ovens that, that really, you know, can do everything as a one appliance stands. Let's say if your space is completely limited and there's no, one, no, no, no room for much at all, if there's one appliance for cooking appliance that you want to incorporate is going to be convection steam oven because this appliance can do everything. It can do steam, it can do roast, bake, slow cook, convection roast. You can do everything in this, this tiny 24, well, I shouldn't say 20, it's tiny, it's 22.2 cubic feet, but in small 24 inch application, one appliance does it all. So if there's no room for anything else, this is the one to use for everything. Warming drawers is, is, a, is a feature very popular in the vacation homes that do host large parties. Uh, as I mentioned in the slide, you know, uh, we'll mention in the slide um, coming up, you can move this outdoor, especially if you do an outdoor kitchen. But when, when you're hosting large parties, this becomes a very popular item because you can stagger it, you can pre-cook the meals and actually put it in the warming drawer and keep it there for four hours. So very popular in the larger scale and the larger party excuse me, in, in the homes that use a lot, a lot, get a lot of usage in lar larger crowds. So with that said, we're gonna go into number five. I'm gonna talk about how to expand the kitchen outside the actual kitchen space throughout the space in general, throughout the home. So we call it beyond the kitchen. As I mentioned before, you know, as, as uh, uh, I guess I remember his name is Peter from London pointing out that the kitchen is a room is disappearing altogether. So we're seeing these appliances move elsewhere. So in this particular case, as you see right here, the kitchen is in the back, but the coffee system and the, you know, uh, a wine storage unit with the beverage center is in the living room, which makes total sense because if you're going to grab, you know, uh, any of this or maybe make a coffee, you don't have to be in the kitchen where preparation of the food is happening. So what we're going to see here is, is basically how to move certain pieces outside the kitchen into different areas of the room uh, or in the house and actually utilize the space, you know, more appropriately to, to alleviate the overall, uh, you know, stress of the kitchen. So, you know, dining or living room, here's, here's a perfect example. You can utilize an appliance as a standalone furniture piece that not only holds your wine, but also, uh, you know, access as a bar per se. So when minimalistic design is a key and the space saving is, you know, is also something you want to achieve, this, this can be an option. So dinner or family room. So here's an application where you can move a microwave uh, outside of the kitchen. So let's say, especially if the, you know that the kids will be using it for the most, you know, most of the time outside of meal prep and just reheating whatever, you know, small snacks, whatnot, whatnot then move it out of the kitchen, you know, utilize the space for something else and have it positioned um, you know, somewhere near. So this is a great opportunity to utilize something of this nature. As you can see right here in the beverage centers I mentioned before, wine storage units, this is all very popular outside of the kitchen space. Basement game room, again, you know, things that we see going there, beverage coolers, you know, warming drawers, uh, microwaves, refrigeration drawers, and freezer drawers. Again, for extra snacks, for particular, you know, need, whatever happens within that, you know, space. So maybe you, you're hosting an event in the basement, you know, of a, a smaller home. So you pre-cook the meals in the main kitchen up above, and then you bring them into the warming drawer down below. You store it there until you open it up. And then let's say you have a football party or whatnot, whenever that has going to happen again. And you utilize that appliance there. Warming drawers we're seeing all over the house, um, you know, bathrooms is very, very popular. So we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, this is actually my favorite one. If you're in a summer setting, if you're designing a summer home for somebody at the beach or maybe in the mountains or whatnot, whatever the summer home positioning is, and you get to this position, you know, situation where growing the house, 
whichever way is just impossible. Your clients do not want to go to vertical. Maybe they're aging. Maybe they just don't want to climb stairs. Maybe just they're, they overall don't want to get into the construction and going up, up above. The only way you can move the kitchen out, it becomes the outdoor. So now if you're moving in the you know, kitchen outdoor and you know that this is going to be a summer home that only will be used during the summertime, why not move the warming drawer there? Why not move an extra refrigeration there? Grill with extra cooking appliances, maybe a dishwasher there. So all the pieces that can be used outside and all the appliances that are you know, outside friendly and ready, move them from the main kitchen to outdoor kitchen, knowing that this is going to be a summer home only used during the summertime. So alleviate the pressure from the main kitchen and bring as many things as you can outdoor. Um, to build uh, Andre, on that, yep. Andre, uh, I, uh, could you go back to the previous slide, please? This, um, this I, I can't right here? read the lowest one. It's cut off. The lowest blue block. I can't read it. Uh, a place for extra beverages. Place for extra beverages. Thank you. Yep. So extra refrigeration. Mm -hmm. Is can everybody see my my screen? Well, is everything good? Okay. So going 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 to uh, cooking outdoor. You know. So if you, let's say a grill becomes your main cooking appliance for the summer home, maybe you do position an extra burner right next to it for pots and pans for whatnot. So because there are options we can utilize the cooking outdoor to the highest degree. Again, summer home, why not move everything outdoor anyways? Okay, especially if you have a covering of some sorts. Again, going back, so you know, deck and small pat patio, a warming drawer. If you don't have a room for a warming drawer in the main kitchen inside the house, moving outside, it functions the same way as the indoors, but you can use it outside anyways, especially if you know that all your hosting and all your events will be taking place outdoors. So this is a great opportunity to really, you know, push this out and, and, and create more space, um, you know, inside the home. Um, deck, small patio, cooking, warming drawers. I mean, this is just a picture, as I mentioned before, we're seeing the warming drawers to be positioned into uh, main uh, bathrooms as a towel warmer. So it's a nice little added touch and seen more and more actually two or, you know, two, two, two of these in a single uh, bathroom with a coffee system. We're seeing that as well. Um, again, as I mentioned before, if you have an opportunity, if you know this is going to be summer home and you're going to be, uh, you know, cooking basically predominantly staying outside, why not move all of this outside? So um, one thing to remember, if you do something of this nature, ventilation becomes a key depending on how close the kitchen is. If it's, you know, if it's positioned next to the house or close to the house, something to consider. Uh, and then covered shaded area, depending where you are to make sure if the cook will be utilizing outdoor kitchen predominantly, make sure that there's some sort of covering at the top. So, you know, so, so the uh, uh, process can be comfortable. Um, Andre, so masters, um, uh, uh, yes. could you go back to the previous slide, please? Yeah. Uh, what what kind of hood is that um, over the uh, um, the range? Is that a pull down hood? So um, it, so this particular slide doesn't have any hood on it. Um, uh, okay. This is it, just a grill. It has a handle on top, and and I think you pull it down. You pull it down over the grill to protect it. That that's just a grill. That's just a cover for the grill. Oh, a that's, cover for that's, the grill. That's okay. just a, a picture of the uh, open grill. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so okay. this picture okay. does. Unfortunately, this picture doesn't have ventilation, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just something that you know it, it's worth mentioning. And actual slides talks about it. So you know, if you are if you're doing a kitchen outdoors and it's very close to the house, make sure you specify some sort of ventilation option uh, for that particular kitchen. For you know, especially where the grill is. So uh, go, moving forward, master suites, we're seeing under counter refrigeration, we're seeing ice machines, very popular, we're seeing coffee systems and wine storage units. So again, if your kitchen space is very limited and you have an opportunity to maybe move a coffee system to you know, a kitchen, uh, I'm sorry, in the master suite or en suite as we call them right now, uh, especially if it's next to the kitchen, it's a small house, why not do that? So any opportunity you have to move in a particular appliance from the main kitchen that will help overall ease the space, you can absolutely do it. So as I just mentioned that before, you know, coffee system, we're seeing this, uh, you know, being positioned in master closets, uh, you know, hallways, nukes, whatnot. The good news about a lot of these is that you don't need plumbing 
all you need is like basically electrical outlet and that's it. So as long as you have a water source somewhere nearby, and I'm sure master, you know, master suite or in suites, you know, master bathroom will have a water source of any of, of a kind. That's easy. That's all I need is tap water. So the good news about coffee system, you put, you can place it anywhere you want. Breakfast bar. So again, going away from the kitchen, we can position a lot of appliances here. You can put a microwave oven, maybe, you know, smaller sink, under counter refrigeration, beverage center, wine, whichever not. Uh, and then a coffee system, as you see right here. So we can move items that will be used in this particular place a lot more often. So in this particular picture, you see that the beverages and juices are here. So this is great. Instead of having all the beverages in the main refrigerator, keep it for maybe food and, and, and something that you will need to produce the food and keep all your beverages near the table where everybody's going to be sitting anyways. So conclusion, we're, we're, we're done here. Um, 81 slides. We kind of went through it really quickly. So um, again, small space doesn't necessarily mean it's a budget, you know, budget friendly space. Uh, we're talking about a small kitchen luxury space where the clients want to see all the attributes, all the features, all the benefits that they, you know, see in their main home. Um, or even if they're downsizing, that doesn't mean they want to sacrifice the usability. So what we do know is that designing the space in a smaller scale can be sometimes more challenging than designing space in a larger scale. Because if you have six plus hundred square feet to work with as a kitchen concern, there's plenty to do. But if you only have 200 square feet or even less, and you have to incorporate all of the features and benefits of a high scale, you know, upscale kitchen in a smaller space becomes tricky. So a couple of things to remember, lighting is a key. Natural lighting is all very important. Try to utilize, utilize a larger door fronts, um, not a lot of color schemes, maybe one or two colors for, you know, per kitchen. Uh, eliminate the clutter from the countertops. So all these, you know, all these little pieces uh, help out to create a less, you know, cluttered visual space and let's, that reads much larger than it really is. Appliances wise, you know, utilize a lot of under counter refrigeration, especially if you're limiting all the uppers uh, cooking, you know, you have so much room, you know, to, uh, so much different option for the smaller cooking appliances, you know, cooktops and range tops, uh, and modules where you can position throughout the space. And then when you're moving beyond the kitchen, anywhere you have an opportunity to utilize other appliances and take them out of main kitchen, warming drawers outdoors, you know, grill is a main cooking appliance outdoors, coffee system, maybe, you know, in, in the library or, or bathroom or master, you know, suite. Uh, anywhere, you know, beverage center becomes a part of the living room. So anytime you have an opportunity to take the appliance out of the kitchen, you can do so. And there's so many options. Um, with that said, um, we review, like I said, four, uh, five different um, learning objectives. So we talked about, you know, U.S. population. We talked about the kitchen, you know, design considerations, uh, refrigeration options, cooking options, and where to put, you know, where to put appliances outside of the kitchen in general. So with that, I will give it back to Dan and thank you guys for, you know, for, for listening. Let me start my video again. There we go. So we did have All a couple right. questions, um, Andre. Yeah. Um, I had a couple that I was writing down, but let's go to Margaret first. She asked about natural gas versus LP. Um, yep. And this is maybe just a general question as well, but you know, in some of these off the or vacation homes might not have the ability to have natural gas. Do you find that there's a efficiency change in the units when you switch to an LP burning so unit versus the natural gas? I, I, <laughs> I love this question. Um, please let me know if you hear me well, because I, I, I do, it does seem like I'm, I'm cutting out in and out. Um, so, so, now that the uh, official presentation is over, I can actually use name brand, brand names. So um, Sub-Zero and Wolf actually, Wolf actually builds gas specific products, which is the only company out there. So what I mean by that, if we tell you that the appliance has a 15,000 BTU burner, we sell it as a natural or LP, where if you buy LP version of that particular gas machine, it will give you still 15,000 BTU you know, uh, burner as we advertised in the beginning. So what that means is that there's no loss of performance whatsoever. And as far as I know, Wolf is the only company that builds gas specific products. And 
correct me if I'm wrong, that's, that's what, I've, what I've known for many years. The other manufacturers, when you purchase the product, they, you can spe- they will tell you that you can use it with natural or LP. But when you go to the designer guide, and I encourage everyone before they make a decision to do that, because what they do in that guide, they write it down. They're saying that if you use LP, you will see 10 to 15% uh, loss of the power. So that's what I've been known for many, many years. So like I said, before they select the product, if it's not our brand, make sure they open their uh, guidelines and designer guides and overall, and they they specify that because I I guarantee you a lot of them will write that there. Margaret, you've got some questions, so you can actually unmute yourself if you want to. Um, We're a rather small group, but she asked, is is this the case for Miele as well? Do you know in in Uh, terms of a comparison brand to brand? So as far as, as far as I understand, the German manufacturers do not build gas specific, but that don't quote me on that. This is a question that you should probably ask um, uh, your, uh, you know, your appliance, many, you know, appliance dealer that you work with. But if anybody knows the answer to this question, please jump in. I don't know a hundred percent, but as from what I do know, I'm just using Thermador as an, as an option, let's say they will write in, in their design guide that if you're specifying L, if you're using LP versus natural, you will see 10, 10 to 15 uh, 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 percentage loss on the BTU. Interesting. So when you order something through Wolf, um, you have to specify in the spec that it's an LP because it's not a simple orifice change on the burner. So we, you know, we does can it come with an LP kit or... So, so to answer that question is yes, we can absolutely uh, uh, change the natural to LP or vice versa. So it is a process. Uh, it's not as simple as the surface because we, what we have is a dual stack burner on all our gas products. So Wolf is known for dual stack burner. We're the first ones to create it. Believe it or not, we're, we're not the only one there now, but we're, we're the ones who created, we're the ones who patented it. It's, it's, it's the beauty of it. What, what, what's good about this is that the two separate burners actually have two separate lines of gas put in. So it's, it's a two independent burners, even though it's, it looks like one burner, the two, the upper, you know, the high performance and the simmer burner at the bottom, two separate burners. So when we're talking about gas change, we have to change the tubing. We have to change certain things inside. So it's a process. We do it every day. It's not a problem at all. There's no warranty avoidance or anything. So, but we don't have any loss of power versus other manufacturers that just have what is, it is what it is. You're just gonna, gonna, not gonna have a performance that you, know, you would have with a natural gas. Okay. Um, there was a question about cabinetry. Do you find that the manufacturers, and let's say high-end manufacturers, German brands, yeah. uh, Italian. Yeah, top of and fall, I see. It. Yeah. <laughs> Are they better suited to um, integrate these specialty appliances or these smaller appliances? Or do you find that local cabinet makers can do it just as well? I mean, I wrote my opinion about that and my experience, but yeah. what are you finding um, kind of across the industry uh, regarding cabinetry? So um, as far as the custom cabinetry goes, and again, we're talking here about the high-end kitchens, okay? So let's assume that every kitchen uh, that we're going to be doing in a small case will be a high-end, meaning that the, the cabinetry is not going to be an issue. We're going to talk about the best of the best. So mm-hmm. it is true that the, you know, the Europeans were always inherently, ab- you know, a, a, a step above into the integration when it comes to appliances, okay? So that's why I understand a lot of times you know, manufacturers like to marry a certain brand names with certain brand names, you know, especially when it comes to Germans. So, but what I have to say at this point, our custom manufacturers are so well versed in, in how to integrate the appliances into the cabinetry that I personally, at this particular day and age, I don't think there's a, you know, there's a difference between using a Pogdon pole kitchen and a high end custom shop you know, kitchen in some, somewhere in Massachusetts, you know, whoever that might be. So um, the other thing I do know for a fact is that uh, it might be actually easier to work with a custom shop, uh, you know, of, of your choice, you know, in let's say Massachusetts, Connecticut or whatnot, 
is because if something happens, let's say if there is an error that was made during the ordering process, they can fix it right away because they have a shop right there. They can rotate the part within the 24 hours for you if you choose to. If something happens on the German, let's say, line that has to be made else, elsewhere, you, the chances of waiting for that part exponentially increases. I'm not saying that happens all the time. I'm just saying that, you know, let's say that something does happen because it's in perfect world. We all know it and it comes up. I would say that it will be easier to, rip, you know, rip, do this with a custom shop versus getting a part from elsewhere. And the other, other thing to kind of make note of, there's a lot of the custom cabinet manufacturers, small, you know, small mom and pop businesses that, you know, cater to that luxury premium buy-in. So they're very versatile and very familiar with all the appliances that are out there. Oh, yeah. um, so not, not to take anything away from some of the other brands that were mentioned because they do a very quality job, but you know, as, as you do your research on some of the kitchen d dealers or kitchen designers in the marketplace, uh, I think you'll see that the quality of their work's very um, comparable as well. Mm -hmm. And just, just to kind of finish up with what Chris said, you know, again, we're, we're, we're in any shape or form diminishing Pogan Pole and Bulltop. These are very, very high end brands that do exclusive, exquisite work. Um, I'm just, I'm comparing apples to apples. I just want to say that at this point, I want to say that our custom shops can come very close and almost match the quality of these, you know, high end German brands of the cabinetry. Correct. I've actually been finding that really where the separation occurs and other people might have opinions about this, it really comes down to some of the finishes that yeah. are offered by these manufacturers because uh, it's done in very controlled environments. Um, they usually have higher, greater technology to handle these spray finishes. Absolutely. Um, and actually, that was actually one of the deciding factors between a local uh, manufacturer versus, uh, I, I'll call Crown Point more of a regional player, but um, they do go national. But um, it really came down to their finish um, was much more consistent in our opinion. Um, those are those are all good questions because you know we, as architects, we always <laughs> wonder where we're taking our client for their kitchen. Do we design it for them? And then how do we detail it <laughs> or do we take the space to somebody and say, help us figure this out. Um, I had a question here um, regarding pricing, you know, in many applications, uh, these smaller appliances that fit into small kitchen designs are maybe considered more specialty products. How do you find the pricing stacks up um, against kind of your regular, more standard sizes? Do you see a, a percentage bump in the cost for these oh, yes. units or do you, um, is everything pretty consistent? So um, specialty pricing, I mean, when we're talking about high end, uh, there's nothing cheap. Okay. <laughs> so it doesn't matter, you know, just take a sub-zero per se, you know, there's no, there's no such thing as a cheap sub-zero. I mean, we're, when we're going into the toll, to, you know, toll applications, 84 inches, um, they're all about pretty consistent. doesn't matter what size and fit. Obviously, the bigger they get, the, you know, a little bit more expensive they get. But mm -hmm. um, this is a situation where, you know, the, the price is not necessarily uh, determined by the size. Um, let's say, for example, you know, if we're talking about the modules, right? So let's say a, if you want to create an a la carte cooking experience for your clients where they can do whichever appliance they want, whatever they want, and the budget is not an issue of any sorts, we're talking about anywhere from fifteen to two thousand dollars per per unit. So, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot if you compare it to a sixteen-inch range, which is twenty thousand dollars. But it, you know, it it's it it depends what you want. So, I think you know we're, what we're we're looking for here is we're striving for we're getting the best of the best. So we're talking about what is the best refrigeration, what is the best countertop, what is the best cooking, what is the best lighting option. You know, who makes the best uh, wooden countertops, uh, cabinetry, flooring. So we're getting the best of the best. So again, 
small doesn't mean cheap. We're talking about luxury small kitchens that you can, you know, you're trying to jam in as much features and benefits uh, into a smaller space. So mm -hmm. I, I, I guess, you know, it's, it's really hard to answer that question. So it's not, yeah. small appliances are not cheap, but, you know, but they're, they are specialty. Yeah, to that yeah. point, I mean, if you're going to, you know, for example, if you're going to buy like a 60 inch range or a 48 inch range, you know, and then in a, in a larger kitchen, let's say, or having a small space that you're trying to gear it towards, it's going to be much less expensive to do a 30 inch gas cooktop and a, and a 24 inch oven with a 24 inch fridge freezer combo versus, you know, a, a 48 inch fridge freezer combo. So price point wise, it's still going to be, you know, premium in the marketplace, um, apples to apples for sizes, but you're not going to see the same type of price tag that you would in a, you know, a larger kitchen per se. Correct. Now I, it, it's interesting because I've actually started to see clients wanting smaller kitchens and then putting more of their budget towards something else in the project um, just to handle construction costs. And so mm -hmm. we get into the specialized, we get, we start talking about the specialized appliances when it's really about solving a problem versus yep we're not talking about price points. It's that we're solving a problem and we're making something happen in a smaller space. And the money that's saved from not blowing out multiple walls and opening things up and um, really can then be used in another part of the project. Um, but that being said, you know, I, yeah, my, uh, just from personal experience and Chris, I know you heard me say this, but, um, we, I designed a very small kitchen for my parents' farmhouse in Wisconsin, and I just couldn't believe the price of 18-inch wide dishwashers. I know Cove doesn't make oh, them, yeah. but, <laughs> but <laughs> there, there was a so many, so, so few job. of them. <laughs> yeah, yep. exactly. I mean, market. they have to make up the money. They have to make up their costs on these little units. But again, it solved a problem, you know, and uh, we went with a 24 inch wide fridge, remoted the freezer, and it was really about solving problems. So they didn't have to create this huge kitchen by adding on to the house. We, you know, in a small American four square footprint, we came up with a really usable kitchen, um, but we had to look at specialty products to make it happen. Yep. So. And I think at the end of the day to that point too, it's really, you know, if it's for a vacation home or, you know, maybe, um, you know, aging in place type of thing, you know, quality control becomes a bigger um, importance, I think, than the, the final ticket because, you know, at the end of the day, we want these products to last and, you know, they're built and tested to last 20 plus mm -hmm. years you know, with regular use. So if you're thinking about a vacation home that's not using it as frequently, you should get much more out of the appliances. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, talking about the aging in place side of things, you know, you know, hopefully those, those last, you know, for the, the lifetime of that, that new build or renovation. Yeah. So Chris's point, you know, it, it, anything specialty product, as you mentioned before, uh, you want to make sure that whatever you get, you get something, something good because specialty size is just like the 18 inch dishwasher you know that if something happens to it you can only replace it with that particular size same thing happens with the small kitchen spaces as we you know as we're going over today um any specialty product any specialty size that you're designing uh whatever you do make sure that that appliance will 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 be a good quality and you know um will obviously last for a long time because as i mentioned before last thing you want to do is you know, trying to replace it with another specialty item. Yeah. Right. Well, to that point, bring back the 27 inch wide refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, 27, uh, kind of, uh, it doesn't exist. Well, we do yeah. have drawers. <laughs> so it used to though, right? I mean, some yeah. used to make a 27. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. We still have the drawers. Just busting. Busting yep. your chops. Um, if there aren't any other questions, um, I think we can just kind of wrap this up unless you guys have any final points. Um, if you need to self-report or you need a certificate, there's the link 
to the Google form and Susan Green will and her team will get that to you. Um, but thank you very much. I mean, this is, you know, we encounter all kinds of design challenges and knowing that there's product out there and there are concepts for attacking these problems uh, is always very helpful. Um, and one thing to be I honest, some people enjoy a smaller kitchen, you know, <laughs> if you're right. with this. Let's clean up. Yeah. Let's clean up, yeah. And uh, one thing I'd just like to add, um, you know, kind of to cover a few different topics really quick. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, if you've never been to Clark before, we have three showrooms, one in Boston, one in Milford, and a third one in South Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, Andrew's the Rhode Island, Connecticut, Western Mass rep, and I'm more in the, you know, Boston area, Maine, New Hampshire. Um, but I, you know, I'd really love, I, I left our contact info here in the Zoom chat. I'd love to have you come stop by because on a few things, you know, Margaret, you had a question about some of the, uh, custom cabinets and cabinet makers. You know, a lot of our showroom has these vignettes that have been designed by these kitchen designers and have their own, you know, specific brands of cabinetry, whether it's custom or, or um, you know, a manufacturer that you can actually see. And it's married up with the, uh, you know, the Sub-Zero Wolf and, um, and uh, Galley products. And uh, I mentioned Galley real quickly. It's a new brand that we just brought under our belt and really ties in well for um, you know small kitchens. It, it helps organize the kitchen and I'm hoping that we'll have an opportunity to do a uh, CEU workstation for you guys uh, in the future. But I'd love to have you come by our showroom, get a chance to see how our team looks to support you and um, just be another resource out there. We have a chef that cooks live during the week. So it's really a nice, um, operation we have we don't sell products we strictly distribute them so it's a very um personal visit and uh you know low low pressure just walk through and we try to help figure out what the client's needs are and and support you with that so um what thank you very what much. is the name of your company and uh and where is your boss where in boston is your boston showroom so the the name of our company is clark distribution it's a clark. third generation owned Yep. Clark Distribution. Yep. And we have uh, a showroom in Milford, Mass. And then another one on Tide Street in South Boston called Seven Tide. T Tide uh, Street? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. We have our own parking lot there. So easy access for you and your clients. Um, I'd love to, and you know, if you're interested, I'd love to connect with you there and kind of give you a, a dog and pony show for what we can do to help you and support your business. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. Was, this was great. Yeah, a lot thank of you guys. Thank you, guys. BSA. Thank you, Dan. All right. Well, everyone stay cool. I hope um, everyone has a really powerful fan or some really good AC. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll be in touch about the next seminars coming down the pike. Awesome. Okay. Thank, thank you. Have a great day. Enjoy the day, everyone. Bye-bye.